Okay. Thanks, Kevin, for the nice introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today. Actually, uh, this is my first time attending Blah. Uh, you know, it's, I, I, I don't know why I didn't find it earlier, but you know, this is very relevant to what I'm doing here. Uh, thanks, the organizer, for inviting me. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about uh, our uh, my recent uh, research activities on using big uh, biomedical data uh, for different kind of analysis. Um, as Kevin said, I uh, I was trained as a biologist and a computer scientist. So my main task now is to develop advanced technologies to solve real um, biomedical problems. And uh, um, the major technology I'm using is ontology and uh, semantic technologies. A little bit of uh, introduction. Oh, I'm not. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is to create an ecosystem for data-centered informatic research. So here I said that data saves lives. So um, our uh, dean of the school of uh, biomedical informatics always says, you know, a doctor can only save one life at a time, but as a data scientist, we can save millions of uh, lives at the same time because, you know, this is power of the data, basically. Um, so here is, you know, basically what, what I am here, so basically, you know, I'm a biomedical informatics researcher, and we're trying to de develop core technologies here, you know, around by AI. We go, I'm also doing NLP ontology stuff, and uh, uh, the one important component is, you know, we need to work with domain experts. You know, for example, for uh, annotating data in a specific domain, we have to work closely with domain experts in order to understand their specific real-world questions, and in, the, in order to understand their um, data better in order to, you know, provide more meaningful solutions. And for my own uh, research, uh, there are actually uh, three major steps. One is uh, data extraction. So basically, as we said, we, we all know data are from everywhere and uh, uh, in different formats. So we need to develop tax mining and NLP technologies to extract them. And after that, uh, we need to integrate the data, you know, um, through uh, what I'm doing is through ontology technologies to uh, standardize the data, normalize the data, so that, you know, we can um, put data from different sources together. And the third step, of course, is uh, data analysis. So we do that through, really through machine learning and uh, statistical methods. So I put some slide about ontology and the semantic web just for background. But I, I guess for this audience, most of us know what ontologies are, right? Uh, so I will just go it, uh, go through the slides briefly. Um, so a little bit history about the semantic web. Um, the, the idea of semantic web was first, um, I think it, it was relatively new. Uh, you know, the first visionary paper was published about two years, uh, 20 years ago in uh, East of uh, Scientific America. So, the, the uh, lead author is certain uh, Tim Berners-Lee. He also is a co-inventor of the World Wide Web we are currently using. But their original, uh, original um, vision about the web it, it was actually much more ambitious than what we are having now. So basically, the basic idea is, you know, it, it, it needs to be more machine readable and machine understandable so that computer agents can do a lot of more stuff um, for us automatically. I think, you know, um, after 20 years, we are actually, you know, getting there. Uh, but uh, if you are interested, you can read their original paper. They actually uh, had uh, quite a few interesting uh, examples in healthcare domain about how AI and the semantic te can technologies can help patients and doctors to make their labs easier. Um, so uh, one problem with the current indexing system, with current uh, internet is a lot of uh, documents or a lot of information is still organized by documents. So if we, you know, uh, go to a search engine, uh, you know, put a, in, a keyword, uh, the search engine sometimes would, uh, you know, just give us a, a lot of information, right? Return us a lot of links. And we'll still have to go through um, the document one by one, open the document in order to find the information we're looking for. 
Uh, this kind of keyword based uh, search is usually very uh, um, ambiguous. Uh, you know, for example, here uh, I'm searching for gene CDK4. But this web page is actually about a book. Also, the acronym is CDK4, which is not relevant to the gene at all. Um, so even if we we find the web page that contains the of the question I'm asking for, contains the information I'm looking for, I still have to go through the page in order to find the information I'm looking for. So this uh, process is, is sometimes very uh, time consuming and tedious. Now, what is the problem? Um, consider a typical web page like this. So um, this is in HTML, which is a markup language. Um, so the computer program knows, really, you know, HTML will give us a render information, for example, the color, the, you know, the size of the font, and, and things like that, and also the hyperlinks. But the semantic content is actually only accessible for us, not, uh, uh, not to computer programs. Um, so what information can we see? Even uh, without the, um, the render information, right? We can still figure out what it's about. It's a conference, you know, and, and uh, uh, because we can understand English. But uh, without, you know, semantics, this is what a computer can see. It's just a bunch of symbols because you know, uh, there's no semantics. Uh, uh, the keyword-based search is sometimes we can view it as just some kind of string match, right? So what can we do? We, we need to add semantics. We need to make sure computer programs understand, you know, what the web page or any document talks about. So we do it through, um, you know, semantic annotation using domain ontologies. Um, so ontology can do a lot of wonderful things since, you know, I think this audience already familiar with what ontologies are, we'll skip the introduction. So basically, the basic idea is, you know, we can view uh, ont the ontology as a brain of a computer agent. It can provide, mm, a, you know, knowledge base. It can do a lot of things. Um, for example, uh, in the biomedical domain, there are uh, there exists a lot of ontology obviously. NCBO I think currently has like more than 600 biomedical ontologies. And people design ontology for different purposes. For example, you know, you can use ontology as standard to normalize data. You can use ontologies for um, uh, providing domain knowledge. You can use ontology for, you know, uh, um, help participate in NLP and data exchange or for reasoning. It uh, depends on the specific use cases. We can design the ontologies accordingly. So uh, in that background, um, I want to uh, introduce a few um, use cases, you know, how we actually use ontologies to, do the, to solve different biomedical problems. The first um, project is called Tamer. So this is actually relevant to the timeline uh, problem uh, Rashila was talking about. Uh, maybe this can help her to solve that problem. Uh, but our focus was using um, EHR data, and we want to uh, see if we can um, create a timeline of what happened uh, to a particular patient or a, uh, or a group of patients so that, you know, we can study their uh, medical history. Um, so th this is also supported by uh, now I am National Library of Medicine of uh, USNIH. And the project uh, is called TAMR, which stands for Temporal information modeling, extraction, and reasoning. So, um, as we all know, uh, the, te the temporal dimension is very important for in clinical research. Um, EHR by itself is historical, and if we can successfully uncover temporal patterns uh, in EHR data or any kind of e uh, clinical reports, it can help us to uh, uh, do a lot of different things. For example, we can understand better um, disease progression. We can help uh, clinicians to predict different uh, risk factors for a group of patients or a particular patient for personalized medicine, etc. cetera. Um, of course, we are also facing a lot of challenges. Um, you know, again, it, uh, there are a lot of data. 
And uh, for temporal data in a particular, uh, a lot of temporal information is actually embedded in clinical narratives, in clinical texts. Um, not to mention that te uh, many temporal relations are not explicitly stated in the original document, but rather into inferred. Um, I'll give you guys a very simple example. So basically, these are four sentences, uh, three sentences, I'm sorry. Three sentences uh, from two different nodes. And uh, uh, we have uh, one simple question. Basically, did the patient experience some uh, symptom before, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they're using the drug, right? And uh, so basically, um, the first step is, of course, uh, recognize, uh, to recognize the uh, clinical events. You know, it's an NER problem named anti-recognition in NLP. And I already assumed that it's up, so we, I marked four different events here. And uh, first, we need to um, be able to infer that event one is the same event of event three. So this is a sort of a co-reference problem. And then, here, from the second sentence, we know that event two was event before event three. So this is like sort of like a temporal um, relation extraction. Then, because of these two facts, we can infer this one. And then, um, there are two days here. Um, we, we also need to be able to link the days to the particular event. And based on the days, we can calculate, we can, uh, we can calculate that event one was before event four. And uh, since we have these two facts, combine them together, we can, um, we, we know that uh, event two was before event four, which eventually answered our questions. So um, as we can see, so this is a very simple question. Even if we want to do it manually, it took us several steps to be able to understand the question and answer the question. So uh, if we want to do it automatically, it's actually a challenging uh, problem and uh, which involves different uh, part of technology, NLP and semantic reasoning. And here is another example. So basically, um, for if we want to um, study uh, patients' medical history, we have access to both uh, their clinical notes and data from structured database. In this example, from the structure, uh, from the unstructured text, we know that, you know, patient has a fasting glucose test, and we know the result. And then two days after the test, something happened to the patient. But we don't know when uh, the test was, we don't know what, uh, when the symptom happened. Uh, but we know the node date, and we can actually go to uh, the structured data. And that's a link code, a link code for fasting a local test. And the values are the same. And the data is within a, you know, within the range of uh, the node date. So we can safely infer that these two right things are the same event. And based on that, we can put it on timeline. And we can calculate what two days later is, and then put the, the, the second event on the timeline. So sometimes if we want to, um, you, we consider different source data sources together. We can actually uh, they can help uh, actually help us to uh, invent more uh, infer more temporal relations. So what we are trying to develop is um, basically a uh, ontology centered uh, framework. We have an ontology called Central Clinical Narrative uh, Temporal Relation Ontology. Um, basically, this ontology can serve three different purposes. First one is for um, semantic representation. So we developed the ontology to formally represent the temporal domain, temporal relations, uh, temporal expressions, and et cetera. And the second purpose of the ontology is to connect the ontology with NLP. So the ontology sort of serve as the um, annotation guideline for an NLP, our NLP um, uh, framework. And the third purpose for the ontology is you know, knowledge base. So basically, around uh, in the ontology, we uh, we specify different rules for temporal reasoning. We also uh, build build a uh, 
Camber API so that you know some of the, um, the reasoning can be done through our code. Um, so this is a very high level overview of the ontology itself. Um, so as we can know, you know, we define time instant, time interval. Uh, we also define different kinds of relations. Um, we published actually uh, two papers for Central, but now we have a newer version. Uh, it's called TEO Time Event Ontology because we saw, you know, the time the time domain is actually now just for clinical, um, you know, problems. So we want to make it more general. So we are now um, working a newer version of the ontology called Time Event Ontology. Um, I think all the ontology are published. So if you are interested, you, you know, it's, I think it's on NDBO web portal. Um, so the second step is, you know, you see if we can actually um, using uh, actually annotate information with respect to the ontology. We actually, you know, we did a quick search online, but we, we couldn't find any um, tools that can link um, ontologies. So basically, use ontology as an annotation guideline. So we, we started to develop develop our own, which is called Semantator. So you know, I think you're all familiar with property. This is a property a plugin. So basically, uh, the idea is to be able to build the text to be annotated, the ontology itself, and the annotated result in the same environment. And uh, we can see here, you know, the uh, the instances. Uh, Belong to different uh, to the same class will appear in different uh, in the same color, and we can actually also link the relationship here using our protege. So a uh, semantator is designed as a GUI for users to browse, query, and edit annotate result in the original context. So um, we try to provide two different. Um, mode. One is manu uh, manual annotation, basically for us to develop training corpus uh, for NLP. And there are also semi-automatic annotation mode. You know, we try to link with, you know, uh, kind of state of art NLP uh, tools <coughs> such as CLAMP and the CTAKE so that, you know, some of the name entities can be uh, pre-annotated. And of course, you know, since it's linked to ontology, we're trying to do consistent checking and some kind of um, semantic reasoning. The tool can be downloaded uh, through this uh, URI. Um, so um, basically, we have three parts, right? So first is representation, that's the ontology itself. Second is annotation, and third is reasoning. Um, so we do semantic reasoning through different ways. One is through district logic, the description logic, and the role rule-based logic, and also um, uh, we uh, also add on a, a Java-based API so that you know some of the very uh, comprehensive reasoning can be done through our Java code. Um, so here are some of the main functions we developed. Um, the first one is, of course, you know. Uh, find a, a return list of events that match searching criteria. So that's a simple uh, function. And also, we can um, answer the when question. So if we want to know uh, when was the patient diagnosed with diabetes, uh, given the event, we can return the time if it's available. Um, also, we can answer the how long question. So that is a duration of a specific yeah. event or the duration between two given events. Um, and these are more like the Boolean questions, say, uh, can we tell, uh, uh, tell you the, if two, uh, given, the, uh, given two events, if we can return the temporal relations between the two events, say, was the event one before you went to, or the other way. Or a uh, given one event and the time point, we can return if that event was before or after that time point. And uh, the last function is sort of a very comprehensive uh, function. So basically, you know, you uh, gave a set of events, can we sort the event on the timeline? So sort of to be able to view uh, the patient uh, medical history if, as an example. Um, so this is from the technology point of view. We're actually um, applying uh, the timber system into different 
real world problems. One is uh, medical device safety analysis. So um, we got the report from uh, um, FDA system called MODI, which is a public available uh, database uh, released by the US FDA. And uh, um, it's actually about um, other words C ones for medical devices. And we uh, actually focus on specific uh, um, medical devices um, uh, stand implementation. And uh, we published a paper just to verify that you know the system works. And the second uh, uh, use case is about va uh, vaccine safety analysis. Um, so um, we studied flu shot, we, uh, and we studied measles vaccines, and see you know if we can uh, extract uh, if we can extract uh, events. Uh, adverse events and their temporal relations from the reports and uh, we can if we can use data to predict severe events before uh, they happen so that we can do early uh, intervention and also uh, reason, uh, most recently we also um, try to uh, do uh, use a timber application for disease risk prediction so we focus on asthma and also um, HIV infection risk so basically, uh, the Tumblr uh, application can, the Tumblr uh, framework can provide the data for us, clean up the data or pre-process data, and then we can develop either statistic and uh, machine learning methods to do this kind of either safety analysis or uh, prediction uh, algorithms. So since for the time, because we have time limitations, so I, uh, I don't have time to discuss them uh, in details, but all these uh, three projects, we have published papers. So you, uh, you, you know, we can talk offline if you're interested in these applications. Um, so let's shift the gear a little bit. So um, for Tamar, we use ontology sort of for, for uh, reasoning and for representation. But I also want to talk about um, a use case where we use ontology for, uh, to support patient uh, communication and education. Because we all know ontology can also serve uh, as you know de describing or defining a domain knowledge uh, uh, for a specific domain. So what we are trying to do is um, we try to uh, create an ontology uh, that sort of uh, serve as knowledge base uh, for consumers, and. Uh, um, we focus on uh, vaccine communication because this is a very important topic. Um, and uh, a lot of studies indicate that, you know, providers, they don't really have enough time to communicate with their patients uh, when, uh, during clinical visit for these kind of uh, topics. So, you know, if we have our phone, we can ask Siri about the weather or about, you know, our schedule. But what about if we can ask her about like uh, health related questions, right? So we would like to provide some kind of um, M health solution for that. Um, for, uh, actually, you know, both Apple, Siri, uh, Apple uh, Siri and uh, Amazon Alexa, they have they they use um, ontology as their backend um, knowledge base. So. That's how we started this project, and we we tried to uh, develop an ontology um, in the vaccine domain, focus on uh, consumer um, education uh, that could allow uh, patients to ask specific questions uh, regarding to vaccine, and also to facilitate uh, con a dialogue, counseling dialogue. Um, so we started uh, to build this. Uh, ontology called uh, um, Vaccine Information Statement Ontology. And uh, um, so again, this is the knowledge base to, um, so that we can create that vaccine theory. Um, so uh, the initial version took actually a lot of um, you know, annotation, uh, manual annotation, and we include uh, six baby vaccines and the uh, HPV vaccine. Um, so basically, um, we designed the uh, mental ontology, sort of a work with domain experts, you know, uh, uh, clinicians, P 
pediatric nurses um, to um, to figure out what are the most important topics that you know would persuade people that would uh, um, promote vac uh, vaccination, and then based on that, we um, build a meta level ontology, and then we start to uh, build the instance level uh, by extract information from reliable sources, for example, from uh, CDC and also from um, you know. Uh, 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 educational materials uh, developed by different uh, hospitals. And then, uh, since you know, we also focus on uh, you know HPV vaccine. HPV is actually a virus that related to different type of cancers. So we thought you know we would also create a cancer ontology that can provide basic knowledge about. Um, Cancer information to the users. Most of existing ontologies is, you know, there are a lot of ontology actually about cancer, but most of them are just, you know, for professionals, you know, from about the, you know, like uh, treatment of cancer or, you know, the biological mechanism of cancer, you know. But the, the consumers really don't care about that. They care about, like, if they, what happened if they have cancer, you know. What are the treatment options, adverse events, and things like that? So we build the cancer ontology around that um, perspectives. Um, and uh, when we first build the, um, the 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 vaccine ontology, most of the work were done manually. But we realized that it wouldn't be scalable. So we uh, started to develop this. Um, Information extraction uh, tool, so uh, so so to help this process to be semi-automatic, and uh, basically this tool can extract knowledge triples from text, and uh, um, our manual annotator will of, of course still double check um, the accuracy of the uh, extraction, but uh, uh, most of the triples are correct. So we have published a paper. Uh, about a couple of years ago to report this uh, information extraction effort. And of course, uh, if we are talking about a uh, vaccine, there are a lot of uh, misinformation about the vaccine. And uh, um, during our um, pilot study, uh, we actually implement the tool and then um, we uh, uh, provide the tool to different users, parents, or college students. And they ask a lot of questions from the misinformation uh, perspective. For example, if can vaccine cause autism, things like that. So we realized that misinformation is also very important to be covered for this kind of you know patient uh, communication. So we also start to um, implement a uh, ontology called a uh, misinformation ontology. So. Um, so here is actually the you know the interface. So currently we don't have a, like a face of the agent, but we we can um, sort of based on the uh, conversation, the dialogue from the uh, with the users, we can some kind, uh, somehow infer their emotion, and then we display uh, like an <coughs> emo emoticon on the interface uh, when. Um, when talking to the user, so that you know, sort of to attract their attentions, um, and the, uh, we have passed these two. Um, I think with uh, about uh, thirty also parents and also a few hundreds of college students, and the usability test shows that you know they all like the tool, but of course you know we need to um, put more knowledge, put uh, in enrich ontology in the future to make sure that we cover all sort of questions from the users. All right, so I think I still have around 10 minutes or so. So since the theme of the, uh, the plastics is about social media, so I want to talk a little bit about what we have um, done with social media data. Um, so basically, um, we focus on using Twitter data for public health um, analysis. Um, so as we all know, you know, like a lot of people are using social media right now, especially the young generation. They actually trust, you know, uh, what their friends say uh, on their social network um, about medical information. Um, so what we are trying to do is to um, develop a machine learning based approach 
to extract popular opinions uh, on different health relevant topics using uh, Twitter data. And of course, you know, we're dealing with social media data. There are a lot of different data. So um, we feel like AI is uh, very necessary. Um, so basically, we want to, you know, use AI to um, solve social, uh, uh, to um, uh, automatically extract information from social media data. So this is, I use Twitter as an example. I also use Reddit, Reddit uh, in some other uh, projects. Um, so again, um, this project focus on uh, vaccine. Um, well, we know vaccine have saved a lot of lives, but uh, at least in the US, um, you know, the vaccine coverage is not optimal, especially for certain type of vaccines. For example, HPV vaccine is relatively new and a lot of parents don't know about it or, you know, uh, have thought about it. You know, some people think it's only for girls, but actually for both girls and boys. And some people think, you know, it's not necessary to have HPV vaccine. So basically, um, we want to understand better uh, why people are refusing it, why people are delaying it, um, to be able to provide tailored uh, intervention. And uh, um, uh, a lot of public health researchers using a traditional surveying method to do that. But again, you know, it cannot be scalable. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's not real time, right? So what we are trying to do is to use Twitter to um, automatically um, extract information, like uh, uh, understand what they, um, they're saying, they're talking about, about HP, for example, HPV vaccine, and then see if they can um, make sense out of it and see if we can find their uh, particular barriers so that you know we can do something about it. So here is the overall project design. So basically, um, we focus on two steps. So of course, you know, we collect the data from Twitter and then we do some pre-processing because, you know, Twitter text is very different than regular text. Um, and the two focus will be, first, we want to understand what they are saying about a specific um, health topic. For example, um, HPV vaccine, or the reason that we start uh, studies like PrEP, or you know, uh, opioid, or you know, like e-cigarette use, things like that. And uh, um, we actually uh, try to align um, the, so the social media content to uh, public health theories, for example, the um, behavior change models and uh, um, health belief models, so that we can um, understand better um, the rationale behind their behavior. And another important step is to be able to understand who they are, right? So the user profiles. So many people don't actually provide their real demo, uh, demographic information on social media, but we can actually try to infer who they are based on what they said. So um, we're developing algorithm to see if they're, you know, to detect their gender, their age groups, their uh, location, their, um, about their uh, races and et cetera, like sexual orientation, because you know, like for, for example, for the prep relevant uh, topic, it's very important to know their sexual orientation. So these are the major two steps, and after so both of them are based on uh, deep learning uh, based uh, approaches, and then we can do different stuff. For example, we can provide real time uh, surveillance to see, you know, like for example, for HPV. We can see um, California is like very light, and Texas is like very conservative. Um, and also, based on what they said, we can also provide personalized intervention. Say someone said, "Oh, you know, uh, I know HPV vaccine is useful, but I cannot afford it." Then we can, you know, actually tell that person that you know your insurance will probably cover it. And if someone said, "Oh, you know," um, um, measles vaccine cause autism, then we can actually text uh, that person say, you know, this is not true. Um, so this kind of tailored inter uh, intervention usually is more effective than, uh, you know, just run uh, just public or uh, uh, general message basically. And also because we know who they are, 
we can also design the message according to their age and their gender and their you know social status so to make it more attractive or they can more pay more attention about you know what um, what the intervention message basically um, so of course there are a lot of more we're doing but you know we're running out of time so um, I would like to thank my group members um, you know, uh, ontology research group at UT House, and also my wonderful collaborators. I also would like to acknowledge the funding resources that support my research. All right, I think we have five uh, minutes for questions. Thanks, everyone.